Well, this is, uh, this is scary because it reminds me of when I was a musician. We used to run on stage and start playing, but uh, thankfully I'm a much better speaker than I'm a musician. So that's, that's your luck. So, uh, long time ago, 1986-87, I went to Berkeley College in Boston and I studied with uh, Bill Fizzell and a bunch of other people and it was really a great time to be a musician. This was all before the internet. So if you wanted to get a gig, you'd have to send out a CV and make phone calls. Completely different world. I had several record contracts. I made 20 records. I played in Las Vegas. I played in a cruise ship. I had a good time as a musician. But uh, in the 90s, I got bored with you know being a working class musician, <laughs> whatever that would mean. And I went on the internet. I started a few internet companies and music. Uh, and then 2001 was the crash. And uh, my company died and went to heaven. We lost 20 million dollars. We went bankrupt. So you know, every American entrepreneur has to go bankrupt. It's just part of it. Uh, and I, right after that, I, I started to realize that I was ahead of the time in my thinking, which is not good for business. You know, if you're five or ten years too early, you have to wait. Sort of like Daniel Eck, you know. <laughs> Music like water. Okay, that's uh, definitely a good thing, but is it too early? And so I was very early, so I decided to write the book, The Future of Music, that you know, probably, uh, and I became a futurist. Now, what a futurist does, and I've been doing this for 10 years, is not to predict anything, at least not me. You have to ask Ray Kurzweil or Alvin Toffler for the predictions. But what I work on is two to five years from now, I think all of us sort of know what's coming. We don't have time to look at it. There's a Chinese saying that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. Because the children still have a mindset that's open and not occupied with making money. But if we're all here trying to make money today, then it's hard to think about what the next thing going, is going to be in five years. So what I want to do for you today is to bring you the view from three to five years from now, so you can prepare for a future that's going to be very, very interesting. Now, we've never had that many changes as we've had in the last two years. Think about this for a second, right? It took a long time, like 75 years for telephone to become mainstream. It took about 20 years for the computers. It took about seven years for the internet. It took three years for the mobile and two years for Facebook. So the speed is just mind-boggling. So it doesn't actually take a future as to think about all these things that are going to happen in the next five years. For example, Europe is either going to crash or actually become a country. That's quite obvious. In 10 years, we're not going to be driving cars with gas engines. Also very obvious. Not, not a welcome message, but here in Copenhagen, of course, that's already the case. You're lucky there. Uh, because uh, not, not only is Denmark the happiest country in the world, according to some research, but also the greenest, which is Copenhagen. In any case, what I do with my company, the Futures Agency, is uh, our motto is, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. This whole idea of saying, you know, let's develop scenarios that are based on foresight, uh, and doing this for a few companies around the world, the whole foresight basically means saying and looking at things that are beyond the obvious. We do this for several hundred companies, including music companies, and, and Google, and YouTube, and Samsung, and many others, to develop scenarios. We also work a lot with artists, and writers, and producers. My previous lives, this is a place in Berkeley, California called Ashkenaz. Some of you may know it's a pretty well-known club. That's where I started my career at running clubs. The fact that it's still there, you know, it's probably a good thing. Uh, and this was me as a musician in my previous life. So I had a lot of experience in the turf that you represented from different angles. And I hope to share a few things with you there. So my presentation and all of my books are available on this website called girdcloud.com. It's a bit of a joke, right? It's really just Dropbox. You guys know Dropbox? Everybody knows Dropbox. This is a Dropbox folder. It's a public folder. You can go there and download about three gigabytes worth of things, including all my free books, Music 2.0, Friction is Fiction, The Future of Content. You can download everything you want, and the presentation from today will be uploaded tonight. So just look under presentations to download this. You can also follow me on Twitter. I'm G Leonard, G L E O N H A R D on Twitter. Otherwise, just uh, search for Gerd Futurist. So, Alan Kay, 
It's a pretty brilliant guy from Intel said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I think this is somewhat so true for the music business. Because clearly all of us know the recorded music industry is in the toilet. But the live music industry is actually not doing so bad, and the publishing industry isn't doing so bad, and music in general is just as popular as ever before. I mean, music, we don't have less talented musicians, and we have more and more musicians and publishing things. So the future here is clearly going to be 5 billion people connected to a digital network. I mean, just imagine this right now, we have 2.5 billion, and all of those in the other 3 billion countries in India, and China, Brazil, Russia, Africa, are coming online at a fast pace. Do you know what the biggest factor in tourism is in, in Europe today? It's Chinese people and Brazilians coming to Europe for our culture. This is amazing because you know, we're seeing this growth and of course they're interested in music and films and all these things. Right? So basically five billion connected people will make us live in a quite different world and this world is largely determined by what you guys know as cloud computing. So basically everything that we do, our music, our films, our health records, our works, is going to end up in the cloud. I mean, it's already with music. We have Spotify and Zimfly and RDO and what, you know, that's already in the cloud. Our movies are in the cloud with uh, Wireplay and with, uh, you know, with uh, Netflix and Hulu. And, you know, this is already happening. But it's going to be everything in the cloud. Everything. Quite scary thought, in fact for other reasons. But obviously a really, really powerful business scenario, if you, all of your live shows, your concerts, if your club experiences can be in the cloud, which has been tried before, imagine the kind of new things that you can do there. And the costs are so low now. When I was, uh, when I grew up in the, on the internet, uh, in the internet era, there was a thing called the Digital Club Network in New York. They tried to put all the clubs online. Of course, it was way too expensive. But today, imagine all of the world's live music in the cloud. And that's what we're doing. Imagine all the things that we can do with this, and of course, also the competition you know, for people's attention. I mean, the, the uh, competition is quite different when you go to a bookstore and you go to buy my book. Then you have, I'm competing with 20,000 books in the bookstore. But if you go on Amazon, I'm competing with, what, 20 million books, right? Quite different. So that's an issue there. And remember, of course, that technology, as we're all living in technology, is exponential. Just watch some of Ray Kurzweil's TED Talks on this. Technology is not growing linear like we do, like, like a regular business does. That basically means that when you count to 30, in the linear world, it's, it's just 30. But when you go 30 in an exponential world, it's over a billion. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So it's quite mind boggling in this world. We're not, you know, looking at those numbers, we're not at the number 3 or 4. Now, and they look very much the same when you count 1, 2, 3. It's almost the same as counting 1, 2, 4. But later it goes like this. We're living in a world that's vastly exponential. So I would say today we're here at number eight, basically. So we're a little bit further along number four over here, and we can feel that difference. But in the next few years, when all of the smart devices come on the market, and smart tablets and phones are 10 euros, you go to India, you can buy a tablet for $30, a tablet computer. Not an Apple, of course. But think about what that will do to our world, and think about the social change that's going to happen. I mean, we already have a vast social change because of devices. You know, when guys meet at a bar now, they don't talk about cars or women or whatever. They talk about apps. Say, what kind of apps do you have? You know, that is already a change that we can see there. It's pretty mind-blowing. So, in this exponential world, question I have for you, are you ready for that to happen? Because exponential means that next time is twice of, of 18 months roughly, all technology doubles in power. What will that happen for you when you look at your club in five years from now? Are you ready to take that next step? Oh, my clicker isn't so happy today. 
So, as you know, the recorded music industry, we're not going to talk much about that because it's a fairly boring topic, and not really your industry, I don't think, because you're the live music business, but the recorded music industry is a giant money pit. It uh, has lost about 70% of revenues in the last decade. And this is not because users aren't willing to pay. They are paying for everything else. They're paying for Farmville, for example, when there's a game on Facebook, $600 million a year. They're paying for Netflix. It's not because of that. It's not because musicians suck. There's no good musicians. Definitely not. It's because of holding on to a business model that worked just fine to their advantage before the internet. It's as simple as that. But I'm not going to get into those details. I think that a lot of record labels and, and the music industry is a bit like the oil companies. They know it doesn't work, but they still make money. So, the dinosaur attitude I think is going to change. We're going to see, basically, this myth that people are saying nobody wants to pay for content online. Not true. But in general, this whole idea of saying that people who are on the internet are not willing to pay is just utterly ridiculous. I mean, when you think about this for a second, right? Apple makes more money with apps, selling apps, than it does with selling movies and music. I mean, we're paying for this. We're paying for LinkedIn Premium, some of you, I'm sure. We're paying for Flickr Premium. We're paying for all kinds of things on the web. I mean, look at this global population growth that's going to happen in the year 2020. We're going to have over 6 billion people on the internet. And those people are willing to pay. Of course, in many countries, they may not be willing to pay as much. And how, of course. If you're looking at Netflix, the movie service, $10 a month. I think you don't have that in Denmark, I don't think, do you? Oh, yeah. You do? OK, so you're a subscriber, so I can see that. I wish we had it in Switzerland, but we don't. Uh, you know, 38 million subscribers paying $10, 10 euros, I think, a month if you can get all these movies for free. But it's better. It works better, it's easier, it's convenient, $10, okay. So that proves the point. People are willing to pay. They're willing to pay for value. And I would submit to you, for your concerts, for your clubs, for your organizations, if you find the right avenue to get them to open up their wallets, you can't force them to pay. The biggest mistake that we can make today is to enforce payment, like so-called paywalls of newspapers. The New York Times, the most reputable newspaper in the world, and allegedly the best writers, in a country of 330 million people in America, do you know how many people are paying $300 a year to read the New York Times online? Take a guess. 1.1 million. And that's a lot of money, it's 300 million, right? But, I mean, this is the biggest newspaper in the biggest country, and you have, of course, $300, right? So the paywall is forcing the people to pay on the internet in a digital society is impossible, because we have workarounds. Some legal, some not. But this is only a legal difference, it's not a practical difference. I mean, all of you know that you can go on YouTube and use a converter, like Download Helper, which I don't want to tell you about, because allegedly not good, you can download anything you want from YouTube. Why do you need Spotify then? Well, I am a subscriber, it's more convenient. But the bottom line is, forcing to pay is like forcing to love. It's the same thing. You don't go up to the person and say, hey, it's our first date, but, you know, how can I force you to love me? And that's what a lot of people are doing on the internet, is saying, you go away or you pay. That won't work. So we have to work in a more native approach to something that's a little bit more obvious, a little bit more together than the rest of it. So we have to just see if I can fix this here. So we want to turn this around. And basically what we're seeing here, sorry, uh, the publisher, Tim O'Reilly, is a really smart guy. He runs an organization called O'Reilly Publishing, and he talks a lot about the future of content. He says if you take more out than you put in, the ecosystem eventually fails. And that's what happened to music. To recorded music. So I won't talk much more about that because you know this is a topic that's a little bit off the center for our discussions here. But we're moving into the future of where 
the ecosystem is replaced <coughs> by an ecosystem. And you can see this unfolding now. The ecosystem that's happening in music is absolutely astounding. You have SoundCloud, you have Spotify, you have, you have Spotify becoming a platform, you have all the free movie sites, you have Netflix, Commission and Movies, it's, a, it's like a biosphere. So all of a sudden this is a really amazing development that we're seeing right in front of us. It's no longer about signing a deal with some of the big companies. You can still do that, but it's becoming a much more networked society. And that's basically where we go, I think in general, of course, there's going to be quite a few changes that are global paradigm change that are quite painful. I mean, imagine if you're a newspaper publisher like Newsweek, and you're finding out that you were selling a one-page ad for $100,000 in the print edition, but on the app you're going to get $2,000. Because you're no longer printing, so now you're on the app, right? That's painful. But it's like a horseshoe maker, you know, for horses, that when the trains come along, they didn't like the trains coming along because the horses were less important, but nevertheless, the train won. We still have horses, right? But we have to change the business model. So what we see here, for example, is this paradigm shift from distribution to attention. It is no longer about distribution. It's no longer about getting a copy. It's about making money with attention, you see the newspapers, and of course recorded music, and so on. So, uh, this is the last thing I want to talk about, the recorded music, and I go over to the other part. Uh, basically, what needs to happen, and of course we have precedent in this country with uh, TDC, uh, the only way forward is to legitimize digital music. It's like the war on drugs, you know, and I'm not going to get into detail on this, but the war on drugs hasn't created any benefits to those who are actually drug addicts, create a benefit for the legal system. So very much the same thing, the war on digital music hasn't created a benefit for the user, the composer, or the artist. Not really for nobody. So there needs to be a new way to uh, work this out. So bottom line I think for your business, don't worry about protection. Worry about engagement. Do you have people who love your club, your festival, your organization, your artist? who really are pursuing you to be part of this. I mean, do you have a brand? The Monterey Jazz Festival wasn't just about music, or isn't just about music. It's about this huge happening. It's about being part of something. It's about being engaged. It's not about being asked to pay when you're not ready to pay. And by God, it's not cheap when you go. So, what is happening here is that we need to pursue this idea of saying that let's put some locks on or force people to the idea of being irresistible. Give us some examples. Amazon.com is irresistible for a lot of people who want to buy things on the web because they give you presents. Free shipping. In America, all of the Amazon premium users have free movies, 5,000 free movies to choose from. It's a present. Dropbox, yeah? If I invite you to Dropbox and you sign up, I get 200 megabytes for free storage. It's present. Engagement. So now with the social networks, you know, this is a really, really big thing for us. This is a medium that for the first time ever is controlled by its users. And you can say what you want about Facebook in terms of privacy and all the discussions. But if we all decide that Facebook sucks, and that they have messed with us too long, they're dead in three months. And you couldn't say that about Microsoft, you couldn't say that about Goldman Sachs, you couldn't say that about any of the other stuff that we had before in media. So Facebook and Google are very much dependent on our goodwill, and they know this. So if you look at what's happening with Facebook, the usage on smartphones, this is the column here, points in one direction. Facebook is the new highway for what we are putting out, for what we're saying, for our conversation. And there's many things that we have to be careful about at Facebook, but I tell you one thing, I recently started advertising on Facebook, and it costs one twentieth of Google, and it's extremely effective. So if you're, if you're running a club and you're promoting something that is unique to your club, for example, Facebook, for ten dollars, you can get some very serious traction. So uh, that's just a sort of a short uh, excursion into the social media part. Here's the most important thing. 
Music is not a product. Music isn't like bananas or like cars. Music is and always has been a service. And it's always about the experience, the immersion, being part of something. It's about culture. You don't put culture in a tank in a can and sell it for a dollar. I mean, we did that with cities, and we were very lucky that it worked. But now we're back to this, realizing that we are a service and an experience. And I would argue that in general that's the case. Uh, the CEO of Sony, the hardware company, not the music company, said three years ago in Las Vegas that Sony wasn't in the business of selling boxes. That Sony was a service provider, a brand, a lifestyle. Of course, they wish, right? In the end, they sell boxes, really. But music is about these things that we can't really touch that makes us feel a certain way. And this is like what people want. In the age of electronics and digital media, they want something that they can touch, that they can actually experience. So, we are not actually in the information society any longer. I mean, there's so much information that we're drowning. Every day there's new emails, new SMS, new, new updates, and what have you. I read the other day that the average person now works 20% more because of mobile devices. So when you're, in the, when you're in the subway somewhere, your employer can send you an email, you're supposed to respond. You catch up, you're just always working, doing something. So basically what's happening now is that we're moving away from this idea of information being so important, but to the idea of an experience being important. And the experience you can't copy. It's impossible to copy the atmosphere and the surrounding part of a, of a show or a concert or being part of a fan club or whatever you want to call it. It's impossible. Um, Kevin Kelly, the founder of Wired magazine, he always says basically if you, uh, if you want to look, go look in the future, you have to, if, the copying, if copies are free, you have to do something that can't be copied. And copies are free. Copies are free. Copies of, of music are essentially free, legal or not, they are free or cheap. In any case, they are no longer a really strong opportunity for money. So, Turning something into an experience is crucial. <coughs> this is a movie called The Life of P that many of you may have seen. When they launched, they filled a theater with water. And the first people that were watching this movie, which is largely about being on the ocean with a tiger, they were able to sit in this water with a boat and watch the movie. And of course, it was vastly expensive, I'm sure. but. This created a whole thing about this movie is like an experience you get stuck inside. That's what we need. We need things to be an experience. We don't need things to be digitized to such a way that we feel like we're consuming bits. It doesn't do anything for us. So basically what we're going to see here is that we have this increasing convergence of online and offline. This is a good scene that shows that you know, we, we kind of want both. We want to sit on the beach and just be disconnected and enjoy the waves, but then again, you know, we can immediately tap into something to read the stock report from this morning by using digital media. And I think we have those things in parallel. One isn't going to replace the other. This is very good news for you. It's not about being virtual, it's about combining those two things. And I think if you take those two worlds, the, the real world and what people call meat space, right, and then the cyberspace, you put them together, you have a very powerful uh, view of the future of what all the things that become possible. I'll show you some of them that we can get into. But the desire for experience and so on in empty spaces will prevail. An empty space means that sometimes you don't have anything to do. And you need that because otherwise you can't take in any more stuff because you're already full. And this is really what it means so to go out and see a show to have an intentionally blank space. Now, this is becoming a real issue worldwide as a digital addiction. 60% of American, kid, American kids, when they wake up at night, do a Facebook update about their dream or something. Can you imagine that? I mean, I, I only do it every other night. 
But in any case, and this is clearly a topic, I, my view is that once we're done with all this cool toys and this cool technology and the gadgets and all these things, that we still want something that we can count on and that we can connect to. We still want to be part of something. So we're looking in this direction, if my clicker finally gets around to it here. We have this complete convergence of internet and TV. And why am I telling you this? Because you know, if you run events and concerts and showcases, the television is coming to you. Basically, all the things we talked about the last 15 years were too difficult to realize and you had to be a geek or spend lots of money. But now what you're doing in real life can be broadcasted. Anybody can be a broadcaster. You can publish and show things and you can uh, harvest those unique opportunities that we're seeing here. So, in this country, I think you already have Viaplay and, and Hulu and other things, right? But in general, this is called over-the-top services, OTT services. Uh, and they will all, there's several hundred of them coming up, like YouTube, Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, and uh, all the other ones. Uh, you'll see here very soon that live events and concerts are the next thing. So in a few years, we'll be able to go to one of those 100 players and say, we could do a syndication agreement on concerts directly from this place, even if it's only for 50 people, because the cost will be next to zero. The cost will be just the connection. This, to me, is a really amazing scenario that you're going to see uh, that parallels what happened with the Kindle. All concerts, shows, and events in the cloud. There's a couple of services already doing this, you know, and YouTube, for example, has recently commissioned $300 million worth of a TV show. Netflix has commissioned uh, a movie with, uh, what's his face? Forgot it, but it's about yeah, well, $200 million for that as well. So we're going to see stuff like this company that I'm a little bit involved with called Showgo TV that allows you to virtually attend jazz shows in about 50 clubs around the world, remotely. Some free, some paid. You could be virtually there. And imagine what happens when you can actually talk to other people with your tablet while they're also watching this show. I mean, this is a really interesting scenario that didn't exist until recently. So in five years, every single club, every venue, every concert connected to a global network. Can you charge for that? Probably you can be part of a charging system, like Flatter or others, where you can raise money from it. So, live stream and concerts is listed by J. Walter Thompson as one of the key revenue streams for the future of media. And this has been a, a fake promise, by and large, you know, since the first days of the internet, right? But we finally have the juice. We have the connectivity, and all of the telecoms and mobile service operators, they want nothing more than to create meaning with their connectivity. Why would we buy a DSL or a fast uh, you know, LTE line or whatever, if there's nothing in it. So we're going to see that becoming a standard on a global scale, and this will be very, very interesting, I think, for all of us. So the opportunity is also to put the fans in the front seat, because it's not possible to connect them. If you want a club or a concert or a festival, of course, everybody knows this already, you want to engage with your people that come there. You want to give them the choice of who should play, you, you're going to do polls with them, you're going to use a wristband when they come in to connect with them while they're there. And this technology is getting so cheap now and so possible. As an example, Pepsi has a fun park in Tel Aviv, a water park. And they came up with a very simple <coughs> idea. The kids come in to, to go in this water park and you can get a Facebook wristband with your Facebook ID, you log in, you get this electronic band, okay? and then when you go down the slide, you hit the band, the wristband, and it sends a message to your Facebook wall and saying, I like this slide, and there's some cameras that take photos of people, and you're lucky enough to be in there. And this simple idea of connecting the real experience with Facebook has sold out this place for six months. Just simple. It was the same place last year connecting people with what they do online and creating this overlapping interface is going to be a crucial thing. So, I think live music, new money, will be fueled by social, local, mobile, cloud, and video. And of course, it will be fueled by having good music, right? 
stats already given, hopefully, that uh, in America they call this solo law, social, local, mobile. And local, for example, means that when you enter the club, if you have a smartphone, you can check in that you're there. And when you're checked in, for example, with Foursquare or Facebook or other apps, you can receive offers from the band. The band can say, you know what, if when you're done with this gig, you can download our last 10 live shows for five years. And this is already a $300 million business in America. It's downloading live shows after you go there. So the, the possibilities here, I mean, we have to take a few leaps here to figure out how we can integrate this technology into the everyday affairs of running a club. But here's the thing. We can learn this on Amazon. It has to be digitally native. It has to be starting from a place that's only possible because of the internet, not just an addition. For example, now Amazon is offering, as of recently, a way to rent textbooks. So imagine if you're in Brazil or in Thailand, you don't, you don't have money for books because they have to be printed and shipped. You can get a digital rental service, and in some cases in Brazil, they're investigating this for $10 a year for all of the student textbooks right on a mobile device. How that will change the world. So think of something for your application that can only work because of the internet, because of the fact that people have mobile devices. I said this many times before, but you know, the mobile phones and mobile devices are essentially becoming our external brain. And Ray Kurzweil calls this the brain expansion. I mean, think about this for a second. You know, when you have a question about something, what do you do? You look it up on, on Wikipedia or you look it up on some app or something. And when you're looking for a restaurant, you check out TripAdvisor. Now, this is all a little bit geeky now, but this will become a reality for pretty much everyone. So, 2005, when the Pope, the now defunct Pope, was inaugurated, this was the scene in Rome, and this is 2013. Right? Now, if you're looking at this picture, right, if you're not getting what is happening, you're in deep trouble. Right? <laughs> mobile is the new normal, and that's basically it. The internet is mobile. We're going to go away completely from people using desktops to do whatever they're doing to a very large degree. In India, for example, mobile access to the internet already is bigger than desktop. And this is really happening now across the world. So if you're not doing something with your club or your event to be mobilized, whether it's a mobile website or mobile apps, or you're probably already doing all these things, then you just miss the boat. I mean, this is cr crucial in where it's going. That is the new normal. Being connected is the new default. And that causes other problems, which I can't get into now. But you know, if you're looking at this study, entertainment and media CEOs around the world, what they're saying about the biggest trend, 100% of them are saying mobile devices, smartphones, and tablets. It's the biggest trend in entertainment. So can you create an app that allows people to connect with you? And, or can you, can you find a way to get them to vote on who should be getting the gig next? and things like that. I mean, those things are pretty obvious and, and easy and already happening all over the world. But to engage with people on mobile devices clearly is going to become the new default. They're becoming our external brains, as I said. That's something that we sometimes have to cry about because it can be disruptive to our lives. But at the same time, you know, we'll have to find a way forward to deal with this interference. But uh, what we're seeing here is that mobile content is essentially the next printing press. The change from the internet as it was before mobile is as big as the change from the spoken word to the printed word. So there is a huge opportunity for us to engage with people on mobile devices and to find ways to actually interact with them and to build loyalty. Because as you know, it's all about loyalty and trust. Do they trust you? Do they have the right artist? Do they appreciate what you're doing and all the work that you're doing to create the programs? and to go through all that work of fishing for the right things. Your global interface to the world is not a computer. It's the mobile. So even if you're as old as I am, you understand this basic principle of what's happening here is total customer empowerment. I mean, go to a restaurant. Okay? 
Put your smartphone on the table. Bring up the TripAdvisor app. Go to the page of the restaurant where they are reviewed. Put it on the table. Okay. When the waitress comes and she sees you with the TripAdvisor app about to rate their restaurant, right? you know when in Germany they tell you to, you know, screw, you know, go away. It depends on where you are. Right? In Italy they don't care. But in general, it's empowerment. Right? We don't like something, we can say immediately this band sucked. Right? Or we can do like the Pope, we can make all photos of him. Right? So basically what, hap what happens here is vast empowerment that we all have to deal with. And so Virgin, for example, has responded to this and created this huge website called Virgin Life where you can connect with artists and, and musicians and live shows on YouTube, on Tumblr, on Twitter, on this huge website called Virgin Life that they have set up for to connect with Virgin in a musical way. And this works on all different devices and stuff, so it's a really an interesting idea. Uh, and this cartoon brings up an interesting question. Won't social media reveal how antisocial we really are? This is a problem, believe it or not. In other words, you know, when I worked for a record label, a big record label, as a futurist a couple of years ago, and we talked about how we would want to open up the process and, and talk to people about the music business, you know what the CEO told me? He said, we don't want to talk to people about this. We want them to buy our damn music. That was his response. So, I mean, how could you possibly believe that if you're not interested in talking to the consumer, and other people around you about what you are doing that you're going to be successful. That worked 20 years ago for Deutsche Telekom. You know, it's certainly not going to work today. So that is a big change that we're seeing and what we have to do to go forward. So, for example, here we're seeing this app from Amazon, the shopping app that you can use to go into the store and compare the price of this product or any product with what is being offered online. Yeah? So imagine that a store owner is not so happy about this when you can go in and you can scan the price and you can say, oh, it's only half on Amazon. Click. Done. Yeah. So this interruption is no longer for geeks. This is becoming completely normal. And we have to use these kind of things to get people in, inside of what we're doing rather than outside of what we're doing. Because, quite simply, on television, which was the mainstream media now, our job was to consume. And on the mobile, our job is to engage. Yeah? That's a very big difference. And this is the opportunity for you, because you, in, in this business, in the life music business, were never so much about consumption, but about engagement. Right? So it's a very good fit to create new business models for this. We see this complete convergence of mobile, television, the social media, I mean, basically, social media are the next big broadcasters. And Facebook is bigger than the biggest broadcaster in the world, and they're broadcasting us. We are the program of Facebook. We are the program of YouTube. These are the new broadcasters. YouTube will be the biggest global broadcaster in the history of, of television. Bigger than all of the other guys. Already is. Billion users. So this is a great opportunity for anybody that's not a mainstream top-line artist because it's about niches. It's not about being a hit. You know, you've read this book years ago called The Long Tail. Some of you may have read this. And we were laughing about this a year ago saying that's not true because on the internet people still like stars. And it's true. But when you are a user of Spotify or Netflix and you have a flat range offering, you can watch or listen to anything you want. There's no punishment. So what do people do? They, they download Cuban music and, and Bali music and whatever, right? Not just Lady Gaga. Because they can. So that creates a really interesting scenario opportunity for niche markets. So one key question I want to ask you, is your organization mobile optimized? Because if it's not, you should do it tomorrow. And it's actually very easy to do. I'm not going to get into how exactly you do that. But this is clearly that, you know, it's a, this is a key point. I mean, 60% of surge in the area of music is on mobile devices. So if, you, if your website is using Flash and is as big as this, you know, you're not going to sell much, you know, through that mechanism of mobile. Is your experience mobile, visual, and social? 
Like, you know, Metallica has a website where you can download all of the latest shows directly from them. I mean, they're really bad MP3 quality, but it's a live feed, basically. Huh? But it's extremely popular. And it's connected with the fans directly rather than saying, you know, listen to us on YouTube. You can also pay, I think it's something like $10 for 10 shows or something like that, very little. And here's something very interesting for you. I think most of you are not running huge clubs like the uh, Ministry of Sound or something. This chart shows what's happening in mainstream media is that more and more people are watching more and more different things. I mean, clearly here we see in, in 1950, I Love Lucy and Dallas and so on, you know, 70% of Americans were watching these shows. And what do we have today? 2005, that's the latest data I can find, CSI and Seinfeld would get something like 20%. I think the data from last year is that the maximum amount of people that you get in America watching the same show is 7%. Okay. Because everybody else is doing other things, including TED.com and, and Hulu and Netflix and so on, they're fragmentation. This fragmentation is great news unless you're a hit. If you're a hit, this is bad news because you're fragmented, you're being fragmented. But basically what happens here is that even if you're the most remote stylistically, you know, as an artist, you can see that electronic music, for example, has done great because of this. So fragmentation, we have to embrace, there's not much we can do about this, and the niches are becoming the new masses. So rather than having a one mass market, we have a mass of niches. And that's something I think we can exploit also for the future uh, to go into a new direction. So you've clearly seen this overwhelming reality that the audience has more content, that they're drowning in content. So what we need to do is we need to create better filters. Need to create a way for them to say, well, they appreciate the programming that we do. This is what professionals do, you know, journalists or broadcasters or radio people and so on. That basically the sense making is what people want. They don't go to Spotify to listen to seven million songs. Like they go in there to listen to a particular song or something that we recommend. So it's not about the noise or the volume, it's about the selection, the curation. And I would submit to you that you, as, as, a, as an event organizer or a concert organizer or a record label, you are the filter. You're like the guy who runs the museum who picks out the pictures that go into the museum. Nobody goes in the museum to, to look at a, a thousand pictures. Nobody goes to a restaurant to eat the entire world's food in one day. So it's about curation. It's about sense-making. Ask yourself a simple question, I ask myself that every week. Is what you're doing actually making sense, or is it making noise? Because if it's making noise, then you're dead. Nobody cares about noise anymore. I mean, we have so much noise, you know, you can say we want to make some more noise, you know, some more bad things. Right? This is about a truly unique experience, not about noise making. So, if everything is within reach, every movie, every song, every concert, Every recipe, every therapy group on the internet right, is within reach. Okay. If that all is within reach, then attention will beat distribution and intention beats marketing. And this is really a great uh, shortcut also to the fact that now we can actually go direct. We can go direct to those people that like what we do, not the other guys right next to it. And that's the good thing about what's happening. If you're looking at a uh, brand like Moleskin, uh, the first question is that you have to ask yourself who you are. What is your identity? And Moleskin has said, we're between the culture and identity and function. We're over in this quadrant. You know Moleskin, the, mole, the, mole, uh, the books, right? The notebooks that you use. So what is your future identity? Right? Where exactly are you? And I would say that basically what's happening is that in, in music, as far as clubs and concerts and events are concerned, you have to become a brand and a platform, not just a destination, not just a building or a date or a once a year thing, but you become something recognizable, like you know, being a platform is, is a, a challenge because you have to do more things than just put something on. Platform means somebody else can be on top of you. 
So if you're looking at all the successful bands, in many ways you can say that for the for the uh, the final few good record labels like ECM Records or Putumaya World Music or so, they are platforms. Right? They are brands. And that is, I think that's the challenge. You know, like Apple has has a huge brand that is a cult. So you can see, right? I'm a cultist as well. So. Brands and music will be a huge thing in the future. You know that every single brand around the world is now saying, you know what, if the internet and social media is going to be as good as it looks, why do we need television? I mean, they have already decided that print and newspapers are out, right? You know that. So television, now they're all saying, you know what, if this works, can we just be a cool brand by sponsoring music and culture like Red Bull does right? or like other brands do? So the future is going to be a lot of brands coming to you and say, can we collaborate to reach the right people that we want to reach? And some of that could maybe be a little bit difficult because of the brands and who they are. But if you look to China, this is already the number one way that Chinese musicians are funded through bands. They don't sell music. People don't buy CDs. They are funded by brands. That creates, of course, other interesting overlaps. Right? But in Korea... And China, that's already become a standard. I think this is a huge opportunity. I'm going to have to wrap up very soon. Huh? Okay, uh, I'll take this out, but um, location-based services we talked about earlier, and then I'm going to come to the final wrap-up and some questions. Right? Location-based services like this are crucial. Like, if you have a club, you've got to get into location-based services, which means somebody comes in and you can connect with them using their mobile device. And this is uh, quite standard using Facebook and so on, but Starbucks is the master of this. Did you know that Starbucks, you know, who has about, what, 35 million followers on Facebook? Everybody that is a friend of uh, Starbucks on Facebook drinks twice as much coffee. It's a proven fact. Not necessarily coffee, but they go buy something. Coffee is bad, but they buy other things. They're a customer. You get people to like and engage with you, they become a customer. They get, it's sticky. Right? That's really what you want. You want to harbor that potential um, of what happens on location-based services. I'm going to really have to skip here to get to the end, okay? Uh, one quick thing is that we have to think about how we define value. And there's a huge redefinition going on. When you ask American kids what they think about music, how, many, how much they spend on music per month, 50% of them say zero. Because they have redefined the value of music not being something that you immediately spend money for, while at the same time, these guys, as I said earlier, are making a killing with $10 a month. So the reason to pay is what we need. We need to define the reason why they should pay us. And this is a mission, I think, that we're going to see emerging Netflix versus the New York Times, and I sometimes say it has to be pay will, not pay wall. And this is crucial to figure out in your position, what are people going to pay for and why and how? What is the reason to pay? Because the reverse doesn't work as a saying, basically the reason to be punished so that you end up paying. That doesn't work any longer. So the reason to pay is what we have to figure out. Um, Sorry, I'm going to have to go in and uh, jump ahead a little bit here. I was vastly optimistic here on my, on my own timing, but I'll give, <laughs> give you a brief summary, okay? So, question number one. What do you want to be in five years? Ask yourself that simple question. Take an afternoon at the beach, okay? And think about this. Eh? We have to embrace foresights. We have to embrace what was happening outside, and we can't, we can't deny all these things that are happening. We have to think about what's coming towards us. Technology is exponential. We may very well have the internet inside of our brains in 10 years, which is a really scary thought. When, I mean, I wish I could have it now so I could look you up and check out your social network profile. But agility and speed is essential. This is just part of what we have to do now. Dive into Solomo, social, local, mobile. That is sort of the key message, I think, for as far as changing the way you do business. Social, local, mobile is affordable, it's there, putting the fans, the fans in the front seat. Over-the-top platforms are a huge opportunity for music video, uh, for opportunities to broadcast your shows. 
And some of that is still in the early stages in some places. But I can guarantee you in the next three years, you're going to see every one of those broadcasters that goes over the top and all the telcos come to you and ask for a way of collaborating to put your stuff into these channels. I mean, YouTube already has that, has done that for a long time, and quite successfully so. So optimize for mobile, become a platform and a brand. Think about what it takes to become loved by your customers so that you become larger than the gig. That's the mission. Because right? not just the gig that they come there for. Music is about experience, so we have to figure out what Kevin Kelly calls the new generatives, the new ways that the experience makes money. And that the ex experience can be larger so that we can sustain it. Pursue reason to pay, we talked about that already. It's about attention, and the last point I think is the most crucial one. Eh? The future of music really is about building this digital native ecosystem. Look at your kids and how they deal with digital media. That is the future where we're going. It's all happening in parallel. So we need to build an ecosystem that works with that rather than repeat what it used to be. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. I have an app you can download, read more about this, use this QR code if you want. My website, my new website is at futurewithgerd.com. And be happy to take some questions if we have a couple minutes. We have some microphones or comments or ambush, you know, what, whatever you, you know. I'm quite good at a monologue, but I would like to have a conversation now. So. Okay, we got somebody? We have a brave soul, that's good. He must be a musician. I would like to hear your thoughts about, uh, in this era, you say the niche is king, uh, something that we see in our daily lives as well, but I would like to hear your thoughts about how these, uh, if niche is king, well, how do a lot of us build these artists? I mean, uh, a lot of people here have a reality where they have uh, maybe a 60,000 festival or they have a 1500 club or etc etc <coughs> the road from uh, gathering 500 people in Europe on your Facebook page to our venue reality where we have to buy the tickets yeah. is sometimes at best murky uh, I would like to hear your thoughts on that well uh, we're sort of in this interim period and this is one of the the, the issues that we're having uh, we're, we're between the old world and the new world so Basically what's happening is a lot of the stuff that really works is largely a little bit hard to do, or, or the geeks are doing it, but not enough people are doing it. Uh, and if, if you're looking at Spotify or at YouTube, they have the same problem. It's, it's sort of large, but it doesn't make a lot of money yet, right? because a lot of the, the crucial pieces are missing. For example, if you take advertisers, many advertisers are not really putting money into mobile or into branding, because they're still on television. So there's a gap. We have the reality here, which is digital and the kids, and you know, 30% of that is already happening there, and the old reality, which is still very much in the going, the old channels. Okay? But this reality in the next three years will, will catch up. We have this huge gap, and this is bad news for radio, it's bad news for print, but it's good news for lots of other things. So I think we need to figure out really attractive offerings to break through that, and this is, you know, this change has taken time. You know? So. However, if you can, you know, just take the example of YouTube, you know, you wouldn't argue that YouTube, that they have a, a billion users. Yeah? I mean, if you would say that YouTube cannot make money with a billion users, considering what they do, it's clearly a question of when, not if. Right? So, and this is, the, we have to have some imagination to think about the point to where it happens. And I think there are some real hardships right now because of this transition phase. For example, when I worked in the music business, we got paid by record labels to a large degree, and we were getting record contracts, and then we were doing gigs and stuff in, in the U.S. But today, it's basically everything has to do with uh, getting exposure on social networks, building an audience. In a way, I think it's fairer that way, because it's more darwinistic. It's maybe a little bit harder, but it's more real. real. In the end, I think that's probably good. We have, we have time for one or two questions more. There's one here. 
Hi, uh, we often discuss when it's time to go home and, and break up with our local newspaper and stop putting ads in, in newspapers and putting up posters uh, at the lighting poles. Do you have any uh, advice when, it, when it's time to do that step? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a good question. You know, uh, how you market and how people read things is largely a cultural question. For example, in Switzerland, where I live, people uh, have iPads and, and mobile phones a lot, but they still have the newspaper as well because they're not so sensitive on saving money. So I think you have to evaluate what is the right fit for which, but clearly you now the future isn't going to be printing stuff and shipping it around to promote a gig. I mean, if you're seeing what's happening in shopping, you know, how people shop now, it's, it's, I mean, e-commerce is going like this, and stores are going like this. And so you can clearly see what's happening is that using paper and using traditional media is, is, may stick around in certain places for a while, but clearly electronic media is overtaking this. It's just a question like if you have this thing called WhatsApp, do you guys know this app? Or Viber, where you can make free phone calls over your, over your smartphone. Uh, the reason I use that is because it, it's free, but I can only call you if you also have it. Right? And so we're in the same place now to where we're essentially saying that we need to figure out a way to, to gain critical mass, and then it will work. Uh, so that's a bit of the challenge there, you know, this interim period, as I was saying earlier. But I think it will only be a matter of, let's say, uh, two or three years before that becomes reality. And keep in mind, of course, if you're using a, a service like Social Cedar, which I was going to show you briefly, but it's a service from a friend of mine, socialcedar.com, where you can actually use a social network to seed attention to concerts and live events using people uh, as multipliers. Right? This is the kind of thing that we're going to see in the future, and it's free, it's effective, it's trackable, it's affordable, it's direct. You know, the old saying in advertising was, 50% of television advertising is useless, is what Man Wanamaker said, but I don't know which 50. Right? And that's not going to be our future. You're going to have 100% accountability for what you spend on how you get people to show up. And to me, I think that's a great potential. Do we have time for another question? One last question. Um, we talked about this earlier, not today, but on the last seminar, but the thing I still really don't understand is, obviously it's a very good idea for, say, the bands or the sponsors, but how would the club make money? Well, um, the concept I, I've talked about is the concept of a platform. Yes. So when your club becomes indispensable for a lot of reasons, uh, as a location, but also as a, as a virtual location, and becomes a brand, people are going to come even if you don't have a band, right? Because this becomes part of what they do, because it's, it's just part of it. So you go to the Glastonbury Festival not because of the bands. I mean, that is a little bit, of course you want to see the bands, right? You go there for the overall experience. Right? And so I think the solution is to become something that's larger than just a gig, or larger than just a ticket. And when you can do that, I think success is also possible with branding, where people say they want to underwrite this kind of brand that you are. So, uh, I mean, there's many examples. In the Knitting Factory, for example, has been very successful in being sort of a, a brand in this way. Uh, I think that's not possible for all clubs, clearly, uh, because if, you know, if you're in a small town, it may be much easier, harder to do. Um, I think, in general, what you see happening is uh, being able to combine the actual physical place with the virtual place is going to have great potential, including broadcasting the shows, recording the shows, shouting the shows, new models with the artists, and so on, which in many ways have issues like licensing and those kind of things you know, that you all know about, so I won't touch on that. But that will be resolved. I mean, in five years, you're going to be able to tune into a channel and say, I'm going to watch this club in South Africa with this band that I really like down there, and you put a coin in the box there somewhere, but it won't be expensive, and you could do that anywhere in the world that you want. And we just have to figure out a way to sell beers online as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the interesting part is that I think with all these things moving online, the incentive to go to a real place will actually increase. Right? You've seen, for example, as a result of Guitar Hero, which is this awful game that you play with a plastic guitar, you know, if you're a guitar player, you know this is really terrible. Right? The result of Guitar Hero was 
that for four years straight in America, there was a record sales of guitars. So people play this fake game, this really an addictive game, and then they figure, I want to play a real guitar. So don't be worried about virtual things. They lead to the real thing in almost all cases. Well, I think this is it. Yes, huh? thank you very, very much. That was very inspiring.